artificial intelligence of the open source kind. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Shri Ambati, founder and CEO of H2O.ai. Welcome, Shri. Thank you for having me, Tanya. Great, excited to speak to your audience. Well, and thanks for taking the time out to, to talk with us. What is the mission of H2O? H2 is here to democratize AI. We want to make it uh, give freedom to users, uh, developers, builders, data scientists, so that they can elevate their game and build uh, machine learning models that can solve world-class problems. Our customers are uh, some of the largest enterprises in the world, and we are trying to democratize AI by making uh, machine learning widely accessible across all their software art artifacts, and so they can then start uh, building intelligent applications and transform themselves. You mentioned democratizing artificial intelligence. Is that where open source comes in? Open source is really about freedom and also open access. Um, so um, truly building communities um, which are strong uh, in data science so that um, you can create a very large number of people who can do machine learning and scale algorithms to kind of go and transform different elements to take advantage of the data they have gathered to serve their customers better. That's the kind of ultimate uh, theme behind democratization. And then we're really excited um, at the grassroots community we've built over the last 10 years. More than a quarter million data scientists use our platforms every day, and thousands of companies use us um, in their day-to-day uh, -day businesses. We build multiple platforms, um, but open source has been uh, the guiding force in how we have guarded a very strong and built a strong community using our code. One of the challenges in removing bias from AI is making algorithms and decision processes transparent. Does open source contribute to transparency? Yeah, open source allows um, the end customers to open up to machine learning algorithms, to see it, to kind of open up um, and know what math they're really using. Um, so that, that builds trust. Uh, uh, but one step further is there math um, is really um, something we've been handed to us over the generations and centuries. And so we are essentially productizing that math in a way that is consumable by audience and um, allows, um, like H2O, we want AI to be universal. And uh, to do that, we have essentially made our platforms be uh, pluggable into the, into into how customers are building their applications, but also how they can take our platforms and embed all the intelligence into the edge of their platforms. So they can really build applications that are smart and, and all of that needs uh, open source allows uh, that kind of freedom for the end users. How do open source platforms affect or influence the, the staffing requirements for an AI uh, development team? So, um, Today, when um, not there's only a small number of physics PhDs in the planet, and uh, every century we can only produce so many of them. And so I think um, what happens is democratizing AI allows um, kind of automation. So if you can automate most of the machine learning methods, um, can people can uh, now uh, share the best practices? We call them recipes to prevent common pitfalls. Overfitting is a common problem in our space. Um, or leakage when you're building a time series model, you're trying to um, kind of prevent uh, uh, using the future in, in your uh, experiment and then suddenly the model works very well in the lab but doesn't work very well in the real world. Those are the kind of things that, we pre that, that can be prevented by automation and building safe uh, machine learning methods. Um, and we call it automatic machine learning. And in that space, um, we have a platform called driverless AI, which is very leading. The, the next phase of democratization is how do you start uh, a lot, a lot of pe um, letting people build machine learning applications, uh, AI first applications at a much cheaper cost. And that's where we're building an app store rich of um, um, uh, simple machine learning applications such as demand sensing or, or for, um, for COVID-19, we're predicting uh, kind of supply chain disruption that's happening in, in the first order and second order economic capex. We are adding, augmenting additional alternative data sets. All of this kind of reduces the time it takes to build uh, a machine learning model, deploy it, and start seeing results of it in, in your businesses. Um, and that's kind of the core, the end-to-end -end kind of um, like consumerization, if you will, um, by making things faster, cheaper, and easier. Um, and you also asked about bias. Uh, in trying to, uh, data has bias, 
So um, how do you try to now um, kind of prevent that effects to be magnified by machine learning methods? Uh, how do you prevent uh, blind spots for machine learning methods uh, models? Those are the kind of various things we're kind of building for adverse impact analysis or sensitivity analysis of these models. So uh, machine learning is essentially um, making machines learn in many ways. So you're training machines to be smarter and uh, it's like schooling uh, a lot of intelligence. And then it's the same problems that you have in schools for children, you have the same problems with AI. So what you teach them, what data they see is how they get uh, smarter. So trying to build a very diverse set of data sets um, prevents some of the bias effects as well. You mentioned open source solutions uh, helping address the challenges posed by COVID-19 pandemic. Give us some specific examples of, of how you're doing this. Yeah, so I think as you, as you can see, um, the, um, the, the pandemic uh, started in Wuhan and um, even in the earliest days, um, Alipay and WeChat were trying to track down contracts, uh, contacts from the first infected people. And it was pretty obvious that um, the, the rea reaction to how we deal with pandemic is going to be very local. So segmentation of the data, segmentation of the model, we built models specifically for each of these counties inside the US. And there are a couple of models like SEIR model or SEIR D model, for, um, both of which are now part of our products. We added those additional elements, um, recipes uh, that are custom, that are able to kind of deal with uh, changes in hospitalization, predicting, uh, P predicting PPNE and ventilators uh, demand, ICU transfers, uh, we started looking at uh, which drugs, uh, alternative drugs could be interesting um, or a kind of telemarketing, uh, te telehealth, sorry, figuring out how to effectiveness of telehealth. Uh, all of these were quite, um, um, qu quite uh, they needed complete revamp of how we looked at the problem. Uh, most of our data from last year um, was no longer relevant because people in shelter and home, you wanted to see demand for demand for certain cleaning supplies was off the charts, um, and demand for uh, pan, pantry uh, pan, everybody could fill their pantries, but they may not be buying those products again for a long time. So you're seeing different buying patterns, mobility patterns. People started moving away from cities, so you started looking at how um, uh, how the kind of the new uh, world of of how of demand in Walgreens and WalMarts of the local the rural areas were experiencing the same demand that you they would see same products they would see from the sophisticated buyers in Manhattan or Los Angeles. So those are the kind of things that changed how most of my customers, which are the um, largest retailers or the largest um, banks, started looking at uh, and insurance companies started looking at where to where to kind of invest. Uh, their distribution centers as well where to invest their time. Um, in the past, you would see uh, life insurance um, would, would be focused on certain problems, but suddenly um, COVID-19 has been a time of incredible pain for our economy and our people. And I think uh, communities have been reacting by using artificial intelligence and data to start looking how the second order effects will be on where to invest, um, where to give um, uh, the small business loans which communities to support all of this um, uh, has basically transformed how we look at the problem globally it is kind of unfortunate that we couldn't do more to save lives but i think we've built in enough um, um, enough um, knowledge and repertoire so hopefully when the next um, pandemic comes up in the next 100 years we are better prepared what recommendations can you offer to, to an organization contemplating an open source ai uh, development program project what questions should they consider, that sort of thing? I think that the, the key question um, for com companies today is, um, is open, uh, AI is a cultural transformation, not just a technology change, which means that they need to um, look for trusted partners on one hand, but also try to learn the change, learn the uh, artificial is a, is, is, is a necessary skill set for most businesses both at the strategic uh, level, but also at the data level. Um, so every organization, every group department within the organization needs to be kind of um, able to trust the machine, what the machine and the data is saying. And, and usually that uh, needs a leap of faith. So building those close knit teams, um, we've um, found that teams of eight with an average age that is actually uh, on the higher side 
is are the teams that are more likely to succeed because most machine learning people who are learning who are coming out freshly graduates uh, are learning the machine learning technologies but to bring change in organizations you need the culture um, to allow you to bring those changes and the connection with the company so i think the combination of um, uh, of um, uh, folks who understand the business meaning of what the data is saying and the courage to change it, um, um, change um, actions, all of those um, uh, decisions that are data driven will lead, have led to much more um, bigger, better outcomes. Uh, some for use cases like um, uh, fraud prevention or subprime credit scoring or pricing of products, um, uh, and kind of looking at time series, forecasting, sales predictions, supply chain, um, ICU transfers, all of these use cases are um, kind of door openers for a, questions that are low-hanging fruit for AI. And then once you start opening that up, looking at customer support, um, request CRM data for natural language processing. One of the biggest things that happened in open source in the last um, year is uh, natural language processing and NLP has been solved, um, relatively solved high degree of uh, accuracy. So with the models like BERT models or um, layout LM, you're now able to look at documents and automatically convert them into tabular data and then start running models on them. Some of our models are used to reprice corporate bonds every 15 seconds um, based on Twitter sentiment, with on COVID-19 cases and alternative data sets or, or currency fluctuations. So looking at the world globally and fast changes are happening uh, and then sudden changes happen, um, being able to react quickly and learn from those feedback loops. Those are the kind of things that uh, dominate um, kind of how one looks at the enterprise. Almost everything you can build in or buy off the shelf, you can get it in open source. It's just a little bit more work. And, and so trying to partner with a, with, a, with a, finding a trusted partner in AI and we partner with several of our customers. The way we think of this is that we, 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 we climb the mountain almost every other day, like, like the Sherpas and our customers want to climb the same mountains. So we walk with them and through the ups and downs of changing their companies to be AI companies. And it's very fulfilling. Shri Ambati, founder and CEO of H2O.ai. If somebody wants to connect with you, Shri, maybe they want to find out more about the work that you're doing at H2O, how can they do that? They can reach me uh, at H2O.ai, our website, but also my Twitter handle, at Sri Satish. So thank you for uh, having us. And thank you for joining us. And find more of my interviews right here or at tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.